Willkommen zurück hier auf dem Fem Channel. Unser nächster Speaker ist Yannick. All right, welcome back to the Fem Channel. Our next speaker is Yannick. Yannick studied media technology and looked into live streaming on the internet and algorithms of video compression. And in this talk, Yannick wants to tell us the basics of modern compression algorithms. For this, please open the language selection tool in the web player and select the translated stream. Und nun, viel Spaß bei diesem Talk. Hi und willkommen zu meinem Vortrag Grundlagen der Videokompression. And now, enjoy the talk. All right, and welcome to my presentation, Basics of Video Compression. It's just supposed to be about the uh, basics of any video compression, which are in basically any standard. Quickly about myself, I'm Yannick, studying med media technology at the Technical University of Köln, and I'm developer at Owncast, which is an alternative to Twitch, which you can put on your own server, and on the internet you can find me under these links that you can see there. All right, what is this presentation about? Generally, the compression um, of video. Uh, so the basic idea is, so we're talking about the basic ideas without any particular implementation. And I'm going to uh, orient myself basically on the MPEG standards, so H.266 and VC. And there's also going to be, no, based on the other standards, 265, but there's a, be a, going to be an outlook on the 266, but it's not, it's just a quick overview. It's, of course, not going to replace a six-month um, lecture. So let's start with a quick uh, lexicon. So this is a pixel. A pixel usually has several channels. Those could be red, green, blue. There could be an alpha channel there sometimes. Sometimes they're called differently. There's also an image or a frame and a frame has multiple pixels which are arranged in a grid such as this one in here 4 to 3 or 16 to 9 could be the resolution or 9 to 16 if you're on TikTok. And if you have a collection of frames uh, in sequence, it, uh, you get a sequence which I here illustrated like an analog film, the older ones of you might remember that. So what do we need this compression for? Why do we why do we need lossy compression if we just want to put videos on the internet or record video and work with video? And I have a napkin computation here. If we have three channels that I just said and eight uh, three channels per pixel, eight bits per channel, for that might be a standard um, resolution. And then we have on a full HD image, so 1920 times 1080 pixels and 25 images per second, then you get um, 1.16 Gibi bits per second, which is a lot of data. In video editing that might still seem uh, acceptable, but if you're streaming this over the internet from Media CCC, for instance, then that's just uh, not possible. Telecom is going to say, nah. And this used to be a problem already before we start with Full HD or with smaller videos, uh, for instance, a cinema movie in this resolution for 19 minutes, that's 6.2 tibibytes. That's way too much. Uh, for comparison, that is 1,400 DVDs with each 4.7 gigabytes or 500,000 um, floppy disks with 1.4 megabytes. But before we talk about how we compress the video, we need to talk about what we use video for anyways. So what do we use video for and where is it supposed to be shown? And first of all, the classic uh, area of use is cinema or analog television. And you usually have one um, cable to the screen, which is stable, and you have a hard disk with the, which the film is shown from, and that's it. In analog TV, you have one cable carrying several signals, several channels, but there's nothing else happening there. That's a bit different if you're online or a TV at home where with video on demand platforms like media CCC or live streaming platforms like streaming media CCC and there you have a less stable um, connection it could be the internet which has issues or you're on the train and you want to stream from there another area where it's used is um, 
video calls, which we probably all know now thanks to the pandemic and it was already important before. And here it's very important that you have very low latency so that people don't talk over each other and that the video and audio also um, are transferred well. And it's uh, clear, especially due to the pandemic, that it's not ideal and it's not that terrible if the video isn't perfect or the quality suffers a bit, but the important thing is it's there and it is simultaneous to the audio and shown simultaneously with the audio. And one um, case that isn't so popular in the chaos bubble, but I still want to talk about it, is surveillance cameras. They aren't usually alone. Here you can see three and they just film 24 seven. And there's a lot of data coming together there, even though uh, most of the time, or maybe just an uh, empty space is being filmed. And we want to be able to compress this well, because we don't want to watch a cinematic movie here. We just want to see someone's walking from A to B, or this is the face of a person or something like that. And the use cases of video compression are accordingly with a surveillance camera totally different from a cinema movie. And a last point I want to mention is um, image recognition, uh, which is used in medicine to uh, spot strange things. And if there's here, it's a problem if the compression moves things around or makes things unreadable, and then you might not be able to see a fracture or a brain tumor anymore. And now that we've cleared this up, we can talk about how does video compression work. So the first thing you might think about when thinking about video compression is that you just have less pixels by reducing the resolution. And this works pretty well. We have here four greenish pixels and four bluish pixels, and we compress those down to one green and one blue one. And now we have saved 75% of space. But if we now show these on the large display again, it's not really clear how we're supposed to show this data. We could um, scale up those pixels again, but then we have a large um, area which has a sharply defined edge and within it there's no internal structure. So that looks a bit like if you're painting with colors and that's not really what you want. The next option would be uh, that you combine the pixels from their neighbors. You could do this in different kinds of difficulty. Here we have a linear gradient, but then you have this gray area in the middle, which comes from interpolating in the RGB space. And you can do this in more complicated ways, such as we have here only two points because we have a two-dimensional image, usually you have a two-dimensional image, and then you have four points to interpolate from. And here there's the formula for it, uh, which is just linear uh, portions of the two pixel data. And the developers of the video codex make some assumptions about the video material that we want to encode and how it's perceived by humans. If you trust these assumptions, then you can turn them into uh, technical ideas. And it has worked fairly well now. So I want to talk about some of these assumptions. The first assumption is that the human eye um, can resolve differences in brightness better than differences in hue. So if we can separate the hue from the brightness of a pixel, then we can save the hue data with less resolution and save bandwidth. So, so far we've been talking about the RGB color space, so red, green, blue. And with this new color space, YCBCR, there's a separate channel for the brightness and then two for the um, hue. And brightness can go from 0 to 1, and the blue and red from minus 1 to plus 1. And then you can see this uh, skewed cuboid there. And if you put uh, blue and red on the minimal value, then you get green. And that is the reason why VLC player will show green pixels on transmission errors. So green pixels can mean transmission errors or something didn't work in decoding. And the idea comes uh, from the switching from analog black and white TV to color TV. So the older TVs just took the 
brightness signal out of this, and then the newer TVs took the um, hue information out as well and showed it. And now to have the color information or hue information in less your resolution, you take this chroma subsampling. And I've shown the most common ones here. So at the beginning, we have uh, four which are sampled down to two or just one pixels. And the most common node is 4 to 0, which is the one on the right, where for one hue or chroma value, you have four brightness values. And this is used in the MPEG codec, and that's a standard in almost all other lossy video codecs. And if you look at the number of blocks, then you can see at 4 to 0, you use 6 bytes, and with 444, you would use 12 bytes. And that's great, because that's cutting down the number of pixels in half. The next assumption is that the image has a foreground and a background, and which means there are maybe areas which have a rougher and finer resolution um, to represent the image. And there's a mode here that is called um, creating blocks, and so you split the image into several blocks. Uh, JPEG, MPEG, and H.264 have a fixed block size, and H.264 265 has a variable block size, which you can see on the right there. The blocks are um, turned smaller until they don't contain much structure anymore. And then you have the structure, the resolution more reduced along this um, edge than everywhere. So here I should, I would like to be able to say something about the cosine transformation, but uh, don't fit into these 20 minutes here. The next assumption is that uh, consecutive frames will have the same or very similar content. And this means we can transfer just the things that changed and use less bandwidth. And this principle is called difference, differential image or a delta frame. And a delta frame just represents the difference to the previous frame. And reg at regular intervals, you transfer a full frame, a so-called keyframe. And this allows skipping. So if you skip ahead in a video file, then the player usually skips to the next keyframe and then continues playing from there. And a series of one keyframe and then multiple frames is called a group of pictures. And there are these intra frames, and then there are predictive frames, which just have the uh, difference. So on the right side, we can see the test video uh, with its crowd run, where the first frame, we have the first and second frame, and then the difference between them. And you can see there's not that much changing between them. The tree almost doesn't change at all, for instance. And we don't have to transfer this, so we can say, OK, for the next 100 pixels, there's, or in this block, there's no change. The next assumption is that a sequence represents a movement, which means if we draw a block around an object, then we can just transfer the movement or translation of this block. And there are two possibilities here. One is global motion compensation, and one is block-based motion compensation. With global one, you uh, move or scale around the whole image, which is great if you have movement like uh, zooming in, zooming out. But the technology is not used that much anymore because it is fairly complex in the encoder and it doesn't perform as good as you would expect. The block motion compensation is operates on the blocks that we've already talked about. Each block is searched within a certain radius in the next frame, and then the position with the smallest difference is used as vector, and then um, that area is going to be filled through another block movement or through a difference from the previous image. And this, um, the radius of searching for the other one can be on a subpixel basis, but that will always depend on the codec. And one disadvantage of this uh, movement conversation is that there are always in uneven areas at the borders of the block. So then you can see that it looks a bit strange at the movement, especially if there are uh, mis errors in the uh, file. All right, that was what I wanted to talk about so far, but now I want to look uh, forward to H.266 or VVC, which is the same standard. And it's developed by the ICO and MPEG, so Motion Picture Experts Group. Uh, they developed that together. And they have two different name schemas, so that's why the standard has two different names.
So H266 has the target to use 50% less bitrate at the same subjective quality compared to the predecessor. So the video that looks equally good uh, should now be 50% smaller in uh, traffic or bitrate compared to H265. So H265 also had this goal. So now we are at 75% less bitrate compared to H264. So what changes? A lot of things have changed. I've just picked out some of them. Uh, that's not five, that's just four. Um, they're creating the blocks has changed, so the brightness canal can now be uh, subdivided differently than the chroma channels, blue and red, which is great if you have a channel which doesn't change in brightness but only in chroma, but doesn't change in chroma but changes in brightness, one of the two. The other point is that there are virtual um, image borders, so this was taken out of reality, so here you have 360 degree videos which have this edge in the middle where um, because the image was composed from six different cameras so it's stitched together there is no overlap there there's no movement from one area into the other and so this creates a forced block a border another thing is the palette mode so especially when transferring uh, screens we don't need all of the colors but we need a high resolution to be able to reach small print text for instance on this slide, for instance, we have white, black, and a bit of yellow, but we don't need the full RGB color space or IUV, whatever. With the pelt mode, it's enough to um, sample these, uh, set these images to smaller values, and then use less bandwidth for the same data. All right, where is H.266 used? The standard is published or um, finished since 2020. There is a version one of the first encoder since the middle of 2021. There is no support yet, or only very little support in the usual software such as FFmpeg, VLC player, or any video editing software. Uh, so it means it will just take more time, uh, but you can build FMPEG yourself, for instance, with the H.266 encoder included. Another point is coprocessors. Um, any uh, smartphone, laptop computer is going to have a coprocessor for video encoding and decoding, and those don't exist yet, so this is just going to take more time for them to reach the market. The adoption phase of, of H.265, for instance, took four, five, six, seven years. It the published uh, the standard of H.265 was published in 2013, and in 2017, iOS used HEVC, that is H.265, for videos by default. All right, that was it for my presentation. I've used a lot of image sources. Um, which uh, a lot of them I've taken from websites or from papers. Um, I'm going to put the whole presentation online as well, and then you can click on the links there. And here I would like to say thank you for your attention. And if you have feedback, uh, feel free to approach me on Twitter, Fediverse, or other options uh, to reach me. And thanks for listening or watching, and enjoy the RC3. And um, go well in the next year. All right, thanks a lot, Yannick, for this uh, interesting talk about video compression. Yannick is going to be available in the RC3 world in a moment for questions. We will have a small breakout session there in the FEM assembly. So feel free to visit us there on the RC3 world at the FEM assembly. Next up at 10 p.m. we will have a schema how verification of accounting votes in elections is possible and then at midnight as usual the Herod News Show. Until then. Oh, oh the Herald News Show, not the Harriet News Show. My apologies. Uh, yes, so this has been the translation for the talk uh, basics of video compression by Yannick uh, translated by Lukas and if you have feedback for us please use the hashtag c3lingo on social media thank you